Excellent. Okay. Well, it's great to be with you this afternoon. Um, I'm Ellie Berman of UC San Diego. Um, I'm this person here on the slide. Can you see my cursor? Uh, yes. Excellent. Okay. So uh, my, my academic affiliation is UC San Diego, but I'm here to speak today as the managing director of the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project. That's a bunch of researchers, mostly economists, but also political scientists and some other folks from these fine institutions, Stanford, Princeton, UCSD, and the University of Chicago, who've, uh, who've banded together in, with a lot of researchers from a whole bunch of other places to try to get a, to, to try to kind of raise the level of the type of academic research which is being done in conflict spaces, which is unfortunately a growth industry for us. And at the same time to expand um, the, 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 the problem sets that economists and political scientists and data scientists also feel comfortable working on. And so uh, Min and I have very narrow training in our PhDs in economics. And we never would have, if we would have tried working on stuff like this, our advisors would have told us to get back to work on something serious. <laughs> but it's now, but things have changed and it's now um, acceptable to write on violence and conflict all kinds of other horrible things that happen in the world. And those papers get published now in the top journals. And so let me tell you a bit of a story. And, and what I'm gonna do as we move through is emphasize the very data intensive parts of this. And that story is very much the story of this project, the Empirical Studies Conflict Project, that the original questions really come out of um, a period uh, which started with 9-11 when social scientists got way more interested in violent terrorism, including me. But then what, um, but then there was a, a further growth, I'd say of an order of magnitude, which happened, especially for economists, which happened during the Iraq war. You might remember in the early years of the Iraq war, there was an initial invasion of Iraq, which went very smoothly. And then within six months, the US found itself in this flaming, facing this flaming insurgency, this horrible rebellion that was taking place in Iraq. And as it turned out, they really didn't know what to do. It was in many senses, the most powerful military in the history of the world. But um, in counter insurgency or what to do about a rebellion, which for us is more of a social science question, they had successfully forgotten everything they learned in Vietnam um, on purpose, because they never wanted to do that again. And they were so desperate for advice that they actually came to economists, which I think as practicing economists, men will know. It's not, not often that people that, um, that the police or the firefighters or the military come to us, but they were desperate. And so they came to us and they said, um, we have lots of money. Can you design for us a development economic strategy which will help us suppress conflict? And we said, well, that's not really what we do. And we're not, we're neutral in these things. What we can do is help you understand how you can do development economics successfully in a conflict zone. And they said, okay, we'll take it. And they set up a grant program, which allowed us um, access to lots and lots of, uh, to lots of resources and eventually to a lot of data in order to help them try to solve that problem. And we did, the results are kind of in this book. And I'm gonna walk you through some of what we learned. So what we learned is, it kind of comes in steps. What we learned is that even though in, in these wars, Afghanistan and Iraq are good examples, it's, we look at it from the outside and we often see like one war. But if you look in detail, what you see is that district by district, these would be like districts the size of a US county in Afghanistan or in Iraq, district by district, the time series of the violence, the way that the violence is unfolding differed dramatically between a place like Aldur in the north, in the northwest of Iraq, in which there was a horrible insurgency and was successfully suppressed, to a place like Al Muqtadiya, which is closer to Baghdad, where actually things were quiet for quite a while. while. Then there was a massive rebellion, and then it was suppressed. And then there were places like Fallujah, which it generated an awful lot of press because there were a lot of US forces attacked there, but actually were less violent than some of these other places. And so what you wanna 
pay attention to in all of these slides, same as to of Afghanistan, is that there's a local logic to what's going on, which kind of has to be understood. And the data reveal that very quickly. And so when they asked us this question, well, what can we do? So what we did was we asked them, well, what's your, um, what's your working, what's your doctrine on how to, how to, how to fight insurgencies and stuff like that? And that um, we, so gathering the data was hard. That's always the case. Trying to figure out what they thought they were doing that only took us about a year. Um, but happily, I haven't talked about my background. I have background in the Israel Defense Forces and my two co-authors on this project, um, Joe Felter and Jake Shapiro, were both veterans themselves of the US military. So we actually had an idea or intuition for what was happening in these places. And it turned out that was very valuable because our client, the USAID and the US military, didn't really have an operating theory of what they were doing. So we built that on the fly while we did the analysis. We built a theory that looked something like this. And I just, I'm gonna sketch this. I will know you guys wanna talk about data, but we're gonna talk about theory just for a moment here. The idea was, is that um, an insurgency or a counterinsurgency turns on whether the civilian population shares information with the government about what the rebels are up to. If that information is shared, then a powerful government and allies of the US are always powerful governments, has enough information in that point to send the drones and use the nighttime sensors and send patrols to exactly the right place and solve the problem. If the civilians choose not to share information, then it's almost impossible to win these conflicts in a way that's consistent with our values. There's also a, uh, an, a Soviet doctrine, which the Russians do now, in winning these conflicts, which is just to flatten everything. Um, but that's not something that uh, the US military is, is willing to do. And so getting back to this information sharing, so the basic idea is yes, a development economic strategy, if it causes civilians to come over to the side of the, of the ally, um, will cause them to share information. If they share information, then, um, then uh, the rebels will be suppressed, we'll see less violence. That was kind of the working, uh, the, 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 the idea that we, that we tested. And here's some data on this. So uh, first data I want to show you today. Each dot here is, uh, is the amount, is, is uh, on the vertical axis, is an XY pair. On the horizontal, what you're seeing in deviations from the mean is the amount of money spent on development projects. On the vertical, what you're seeing is violent incidents. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Yeah. And then the red line here is a linear regression of incidents on spending with uh, all demeaned. So I've recentered everything on zero, zero. And so um, we would go- oh, Sorry, to... remind me, what is C, 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 CRP? The... Okay, C, CRP is the Commander's Emergency Response Program. This is development spending. And the way this happens is um, a lieutenant or a colonel or a captain. Um, so the, the commander of some force in Iraq, in this case, would have a budget and they could be, they'd be able to go to the elders of a village and say, we could reconstruct your school or we could pave a road or we could okay. paint things or we could dig a well. Um, relatively small budget activities, things that would cost up to $50,000. $50,000 buys a lot in this place, but something like that. And this is kind of how much they spent on those projects. Mm. Okay, D, D mean. And I see men, we do. Yeah, this is a show what about. Yeah, I'm not allowing. I'm not sure what features I have to remove, you know, but, uh, but please, the people who are on the call, you know, we try to do it, you know, it's for, for the benefit of all of us, you know, so it's really silly to, to do that, right? So, yeah, I hate externalities. So, um, okay, let, let's try to do it. Uh, I don't know if the scribbling is going to appear again or. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you, yeah. okay, so back to this graph. Yeah. So you can imagine, you know, you show up at the headquarters of some general and you show them this graph and they say, wait, the more we spend, the more violence. 
And you say, well, um, do you remember that class at West Point where they taught you about reverse causality or about emitted variable bias or stuff like that? And they look at you like, you know, we're in a conflict zone. Will you stop, please, professor? And we say, well, actually, this general is a sign that you're doing your job. You're spending more money in places that have bigger problems. And they go, oh, okay. But how can I see, professor, what good work I'm doing? And we say, oh, for that, we do do first differences. So this next graph over here shows the change in the level of violence on the y-axis and the change in spending on the x-axis. And here what you see the slope of this one, we would interpret as reductions in violence associated with spending on these projects. And, um, and in fact, over time, they get better at that. So that slope is negative. It's actually so negative, this slope, that this is the most cost-effective way of reducing violence in Iraq. It's way better than adding more Humvees or using more missiles or anything like that, as far as, as, far as we can tell. All right, so there's one example of just using, using data. Um, we did some more stuff where we showed them that the large projects they were running out of the same budget were probably violence increasing, but the small, but the small projects were violence decreasing. So there's a, and that, um, that insight was so valuable to them that they actually rejiggered their, um, their development project budget within the US military to refocus the budget on very small projects. And they started giving the, the captains and the lieutenants a lot more ability to consult with the local community and more leeway to spend money. So, um, so there's, there, there, there's an example of I would call, what I would call maybe not AI for good because this was just linear regression, but applying data to the problem in a way that was useful. Yeah. Another implication, remember I told you that it was the, it was the tips or the, the shared information that, that drive this model. And so what I can show you is they eventually, we achieved a level of trust with the US military and the Iraqi forces that they would share their tip data with us. And what you can see here, these are tip data, this is a time series. And what you see here is that depending on who caused the event, you could check how well you were doing in public attitudes and how well you could, how well the forces, Iraqi or US or allied or, or US could reduce violent incidents by the size of the tip flow. And what I'm showing you here is that um, if, the, if the US forces or Iraqi forces got in trouble by generating civilian casualties, by accidentally or maybe on purpose killing civilians, this is the coefficient on tip flow, which is negative. The, um, the Iraqi insurgents didn't have the same problem. They could always argue that if they killed civilians, they had some good reason. But the Allied forces, the coalition forces, didn't have that, um, didn't have that option. This little piece of evidence was very useful in resolving a debate within uh, NATO Afghanistan and within um, a CENTCOM Iraq on whether you wanted to be more careful about not hurting civilians. So, you know, if uh, a platoon or a battalion in the field, the easiest way for them to protect themselves is by calling in artillery and having the artillery or airstrikes flatten all the things that they think threaten them. But when you do that, that's a very blunt instrument if that tends to generate civilian casualties. And what we could show with a coefficient like this was that those civilian casualties were backfiring and undermining the effort to suppress the insurgents. So there was not only an ethical problem, there was also an operational problem. Um, I'm gonna skip one and kind of skip to, to, to another great example that I really like. It improved attitudes and it improves people's faith in their government it also in, it gave us and it gave the US and the coalition forces, NATO, um, improved uh, tips from local civilians about, about Taliban presence. 
Now, other things went wrong, and we're going to revisit all those things again. But so let me give you some other examples. Um, a lot of people think that um, that conflict in Africa um, is linked to natural resources. That's actually it's easy to bring data to bear on that. So what I'm showing you here is a map of Africa, uh, Africa and a big chunk of the Middle East, including Iraq. A red dot here is Aklet. That's an incident, a violent incident, and there's tons of data on that now from lots of sources. And these are the different minerals involved. Okay, and what you see is that there's a big swath of violence here, which isn't particularly correlated with mineral wealth. So sometimes mineral wealth is a problem. Oil, there's violence associated with oil in Iraq, for instance. There's violence which seems to be close to oil in Yemen, but there's also violence for lots of other reasons. I mean, like region like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Tigray, and so on, but I thought like civil war, but they don't have anything I mean, there, right? In this, uh, this region. I mean, no oh, yeah. So actually, I spent some time in Addis, yeah? in Addis Ababa, yes, uh, okay. quite a while ago. Yeah. So Tigray is up here. Yes. Tigray is not a resource rich area. Yes. Yeah. The, the thing about Tigray is that it's mountainous and it's very hard for a central government to control. So it's, in a sense, the mountainousness. So th this is another thing that, you know, if I showed you how difficult the terrain is on this map, mm. that would be highly correlated with violence. Oh. Afghanistan, it, then, then is it the same thing as Afghanistan too, right? A lot of mountains. You know, the, yeah, yeah, region, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, a consistent predictor of, of rebel presence and of violence, if the government even tries to control the territory, is the unevenness of the terrain, or just kind of the difficulty of the terrain. And uh, yeah, that's Tigray up there, is, is that. But there are other problems in Afghanistan, in Ethiopia as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Here's another one that I want to show you because it uses data that we hadn't seen very much before. This is work by my colleagues, Josh Blumenstock at Berkeley, Tara Ghani at, uh, at uh, Washington University, St. St. Louis, uh, Sivan at IFPRI, Ethan at um, Princeton now, Tom Sherry, USIP, Atumet at the University of Washington. What's cool about this is they're going to show you uh, the use of cell phone data, which was something that until recently we did not get access to. But let me show you what you can do with it. So here's a map of Afghanistan. And this is a month in which Kunduz, most of Afghanistan, this is 2015, most of the Afghanistan is still controlled by the Afghan government. Kunduz has a month in which it's controlled by the Taliban. When the Taliban takes over control of Kunduz, this is a time series of the cell phone data. Okay, and what you're seeing here is these, the green line is calls, are local calls within 10 kilometers of the towers of Kunduz. And the orange line calls that go outside that 10 kilometers, 10 to 70 kilometers long. But again, that, that have one end of the call is, is in Kunduz. Here's where the Taliban take over at uh, the end of September 2015. And then they control for about a month. And what you see is there's an immediate increase in local and far calls. Mm -hmm. During the, during the takeover period. Once they take over, there's a sharp drop in local calls as, uh, as people are moving out of the territory and as people stop doing business in the territory. There's an increase during that same period in the far away calls as people figure out where they're gonna go, they speak to their relatives about where to go, they coordinate their their own evacuation. So this is this is this is interesting for two reasons, I think. One is um, conquest of territory has a very clear footprint in cell traffic, without even knowing, without having to monitor what the content of the call is. You can just tell from the location and distance of calls. The other is, you know, these people who are calling far away. They're locally displaced people. They're, they're local refugees. And you can track local refugees and you can take care of local refugees and you can make sure that roads are open for local refugees because they're carrying phones in their pocket. This is 
a totally different world than what existed 20 years ago in terms of the ability, the technology that exists in order to, uh, to take care of these problems. So today, so, in, uh, today in Ukraine, you could do the same thing. Like if the Russian troops are calling home, you yep. see they are not calling a long, long, long distance or versus the Ukrainians who have a more local calls or who, you know, who call uh, in Ukraine. Oh yeah! In fact, there's um, that's true on both sides, right? Yeah. It's it's pretty clear now that um, one of the sources of intelligence that is being fed to the Ukrainians by the British and the Americans and maybe some others is coming from the cell phones in the pockets of Russian soldiers. Mm. Um, but it's also true that the Ukrainians have done a very impressive job of managing their own civilian population during this conflict are using cell phones. Um, in uh, very innovative ways. Even the internet now, now they, I mean, they have uh, they have access to the internet. You could, you should maybe even like give give the Russians access to the internet <laughs> so they can be tracked. Uh, so, so that's a project that's ongoing both in Russia and in Iran now. Oh, okay. With the protests, the idea is to give access to the internet using all kinds of technologies and. Um, uh, it it requires some rewriting of sanctions mm -hmm. um, regulations, which had which often block internet access. Okay, okay let me. Um, at, let me show you some more data intense yeah. issues. So one of the questions in conflict is the government, which is usually a U.S. ally. When it takes over territory, is that really good for the people that live there? You know, maybe the rebels were rebelling for some good reason. So the Philippines has had an ongoing low-level rebellion for a long, long time, so there's actually a ton of data. And there, um, we came into some data through the relationship of one of my co-authors with the, with the Philippine military on something that was called peace and development teams, which is basically when they send uh, a squad or a, or, a, or, a, or a platoon into the hills to keep the rebels out, usually with the cooperation of local civilians. And um, now there's not a lot you can measure in terms of outcomes, but one thing that's really well measured in the Philippines is malnutrition of children. And what you can show, so here's, I would just to give you the big data picture of this, a green dot here is a village in the Philippines where um, this program, the PDT program, Peace and Development Teams, were active over a nine year period. And what you see is that a lot of the Philippines um, had a rebel presence. And, um, and so, uh, so, so, so this actually happened. All right. Now, and what you'll notice is there's more presence in the south and in the middle than there is in the north. But generally, there there's lots of rebels in lots of places. In the south, it tends to be um, Islamists. In the middle and in the north, they tend to be um, Marxists or neo-Marxists. You might you might say. And what you find is, if you kind of look at the differences and differences on this is that um, you see a 64% reduction in malnutrition of children um, accompanying the presence of the government troops as opposed to the rebel troops. And so that's one of the things that you know, we, can, we can learn by, by basically doing this. Mm -hmm. So you can almost think of the government reconquering territory as a public health initiative. Now, that's pretty big data, 42,000 observations, for a death of 1,000, Barangay, which is more or less a village mm -hmm. uh, or a village-sized unit um, spread over nine years. We've got, in, I want to say, biannual data, no, quarterly data. And uh, here, here's just a, a graph to show you how big that effect is. Um, we've got time for one more? Yeah, yeah, All right. go ahead, next. Yeah. Okay, so here's a, uh, a micro data-based project, which, um, which requires a theory that kind of that resonates in, I think, quite quite broadly these days. So this is really a, a mutual deterrence theory. 
So the issue here is that there's been uh, kind of a, a, a festering, relatively small scale conflict going on between Gaza and Israel um, since the Hamas took control of Gaza in 2007, I want to say. And the problem is um, missiles and rockets that are launched from this area, from Gaza, into the rest of Israel, and they now have a range that goes, that, that, that covers all, all the large population centers in Israel. So this is kind, kind of an issue. Now, um, now, the nature of this conflict is um, a missile gets launched or a rocket gets launched out of Gaza, Israel retaliates sometimes, not always, but Israel retaliates in some way. And then they shoot back and forth at each other for sometimes hours, sometimes days, and then they stop and it's quiet for a couple of days. And then it starts up again. What we wanted to do was understand the, the nature of this conflict, why it was starting, why it was ending, whether is shooting back um, amplified the conflict, made things worse, or whether it deterred the conflict. So whether deterrence worked in this sense. The data source here is, I think, interesting for you folks. Um, the, the, the basic unit of data is a United Nations incident report, which will have a date on it, and will explain kind of what happened. And then what we'll do is we'll take that text, we'll process it, and, and make it into numbers. So this will become three mortars fired at this timestamp. And then the response was an M16 fired a missile back and it'll capture the sequence of insults from one side to the other. Um, and so that, that requires text analysis that was very sophisticated 10 years ago and is now kind of pretty standard stuff. But we're, we're trying to get more out of this. When you code it up, it looks like this. This is what the incidents look like. Mortars and RPGs fired from Gaza, rockets fired from Gaza. Israel responds with shelling and airstrikes for the most part. Now that allows us, once it's coded, to create what I think an IO economist would find familiar, these best response functions. Mm -hmm. And so here, what you see is, here's what looks like the Israeli response function. Mm -hmm. If you do this much damage to me, I will respond with this much damage to you. And here's the Gazan response function. Mm -hmm. If you do this much damage to me, I will respond. If you do th yeah, this much damage to me, yeah. I will respond with this much damage to you. Okay, so you kind of flip the axes. So Gaza is more, oh, I, oh, I don't know how the scale is. Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah, it's the scale is a bit different. So, if I'm not, is, is it the that, scale? Is it, yeah, yeah, the scale, the scale is different. Yeah, it's a bit di different. So, I don't know how to interpret the slope. Is it that we say that Gaza is more aggressive in terms of response or no? Um, um, yeah, so 45 degrees would look something like, like, uh, like this. Okay, yeah. Right? And, but there are a number of things that are fascinating about this. One is where those curves cross is in equilibrium. Hmm. Another is this pattern, because the, um, the, the product of the slopes is actually less than 45 degrees. Um, these, in, in this sector, the responses will converge to an equilibrium. This is a stable equilibrium. Okay. Yeah. Another interesting part about this, which we're just, this is preliminary work, but I, it's the most exciting for me because I don't really fully understand it yet, mm -hmm. is that um, this equilibrium is, is south of zero. How does that happen? Well, Israel actually has, has the option of generating negative damage. What's negative damage? Reconstruction. Oh, no. oh, no. Exactly. If you do, or if you open borders, and allow trade. Okay. Yeah. Then you trucks flow in, Gaza is allowed imports, and that's negative damage, it's benefits. Yeah. So what's really unusual about this is you've got a two-sided game that we can measure what's going on in real time. We know that it's got a stable equilibrium, which means that 
um, attacking is actually deterring. It, you suppress by attacking. Sometimes they say funny things like in English to describe this, but this is rigorous. But this is called escalating to de-escalate, sometimes in literature. Um, and the equilibrium is actually a relatively peaceful one, not for the Israeli side that still suffers damage in equilibrium, but for the Gazan side. That, that, so an equilibrium exists that, have, that could have no damage in it, that could, have, that could be net positive. Now, there are a pile of measurement issues and all kinds of stuff in here about how you measure net damage and all these things. But it's a, this is a nice example where the analysis of the text allows us to quantify, which allows us to build the best response function, which allows us kind of uh, a theoretically rigorous way of thinking through this problem. Now, and what I would say is that who cares? Well, many of the conflicts that we have today have this nature where um, it's not that we have a big war every once in, every once in a while, since the Second World War, most countries in the world have not been in war at all in the conventional sense. But almost everybody is engaged in ongoing conflict and insult in cyberspace or in disinformation space or in influence operation space. And those are ongoing. And when and, we do that, do we, uh, do we span because so because we use history, we use historical data here, so we try to estimate the the, the, the main response. But they are like they are consistent with a set of strategies, right? So can we come up with? We might not be able to come up with new strategies that have not been tried before. Right? A bit constrained by that. But. Oh, this, so so that is in fact the question of the day. The um, the 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 current doctrine that the U.S. military. Is, has been thinking about for the last year and just unveiled two weeks ago in the national security strategy is something called integrated deterrence, where you try to integrate your positive sun activity with your negative sun activity with that of the allies in the idea of, say, when you confront North Korea or Iran or China or Russia, you're simultaneously doing all the stuff, the negative, the, the positive and the negative, and you're saying, well, you know, if we shift our curve so that we move from an equilibrium down here, which is very positive mm -hmm. in terms of welfare outcomes, both sides, to a curve down to this equilibrium, ah, what that means is we've done, we've, we've moved in a negative some way. Both sides suffered. But threatening to do that might allow you to stabilize the behavior of the other side. And so they'll stop some doing, doing all this damaging stuff mm -hmm. up in negative some space. And so that, in principle, is a way of integrating a discussion of trade sanctions with a discussion of actual coercive violence, with a, with a discussion of how, how valuable the trade is to us. One issue also is that, for us, with, with China, we uh, are mixing a bit of things that is uh, kind of apples and oranges, right? Because we have like gain from trade, right? That can be measured in dollars or GDP and so on. Right. So security issue, you know, inter uh, I guess intellectual, intellectual property, maybe you can put a amount of money on it, but it's, it's kind of difficult, right? We like, <laughs> we, oh. uh, right? So, yeah, yeah it, no, I, I, I agree it's difficult, but remember, if the, you know, in using the terms that we usually like to use, social welfare maximization, the idea here is that, you know, this is the social welfare of one side, and this is the social welfare of the other side, except up is negative yeah. in the way I've drawn it right here. Yes, yeah. What you want to be is very far in the in in the southwest, yeah. you know, where I live. Yeah. And um, and then you have all the conventional problems of measuring GDP and GDP not being welfare, all these all the problems that come with the national accounting, you've got all of those. And then you've got to measure the disutility as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but I think that's the intellectual challenge. Oh, okay. And how do we include, because these games are dynamic, right? So uh, when we have like, you know, uh, uh, you know, I mean, you have the, the easiest like a tit for tat, or, you know, we have like a, so deterrence is also like a dynamic, it's like a, a dynamic game. You want, you want to like a, 
threaten ret uh, retaliation uh, and so on. So does it, does, would it fit in this kind of graph or does it have to be more complex than that? Um, um, so you can, you can run those games with continuous um, support. Mm -hmm. We know that, but you know, I mean, a lot of what we know in game theory came as a result of the massive subsidization of game theory research by the Office of Naval Research. So yeah. we could work out our nuclear strategy, yeah. which is well worked out and rigorous. Yeah. yeah. Right? So like the generation before us, that's what you know the theorists spent a lot of their time on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like Rand you know, and all this kind of organization too, right? Yeah. It, exactly. Nobel prizes were awarded, but that's a two-sided game, yes. which is only in only in negative subspace. Yeah. Right. This is potentially a multi-sided game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we have uh, even we have yeah, you know, Russia, China, U.S., Europe. You know, and then you go into Africa. Right. It's even it's even very complex. Indeed. Right. But they they never integrated the positive sum part of it. Yeah. And during the Cold War, and then after the Cold War, they stopped. So, but now it's all back. Yeah. And so, and 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 what's remarkable is that the, given the data. Uh, the data collection capabilities, which are 10,000 times greater now than they were in 1980 or in 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell, right? Um, we, one could now imagine to empirically fit um, these determinants models, not of course on the nuclear air, right, but in these relatively low, um, low damage things, which are in, in terms of conflict, they're low damage, in terms of the loss of welfare, they're huge because of the effects of trade or the effects of you know having to run for the shelters all the time, or worrying about what the Russians are going to do next, or of being cold in you know in the Netherlands over the winter. That stuff. So um, let, me, I, let me do a summary slide, and then if yeah. anybody still wants to ask questions, all right. So that what's interesting, is, and so so as as managing director of this project, let me say that the stories I was telling you about Iraq, Afghanistan are all written up in a book, this book. Then there's other research about other related things, um, but in, this one is kind of the one that might be aimed most at your community. What's stopping, so if I ask, you know, what's stopping this research field from taking off even faster than it is, is not a lack of questions or a lack of scholars or a lack of interest by journals or any of those things. That landscape has changed completely over the last 20 years. What is difficult is that the infrastructure to do the data intensive part of it and the game theory part of it that we were just talking about in the case of determinism, that is difficult because it means that economists have to talk to all these other people and you need an infrastructure in place to work on it. And that infrastructure really should not be provided by the US government, it should be provided by some kind of more neutral party. Mm. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's as, it's one of the faster growing parts, maybe the fastest growing part of uh, empirical economic research. How, how about the UN? Would the UN fund this kind of, uh, this kind of projects or not really? Or, or, or do you think UN is not neutral? Yeah. It, no, the problem is that the UN is relatively low tech. Okay. In its, I mean, they're very good at a number of things. They're very good at diplomacy. They've got a tremendous amount of experience of peacekeeping, yeah. but they don't, they're, you know, there is something called the UN University. Yes. Mostly they're training diplomats to do things that they know how to do already. They're just kind of passing information. They don't have a strong research arm. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, it's really, it's, it's not their forte. They have their hands full doing other things and they, their relationship with the um, with the academic research community is also not as strong as it could be. That's partially on us, but I think it's partially on them as well. How about World Bank? Uh, World Bank has more tradition of you have a lot of economists working there. Um, so, so the World Bank, um, the World Bank kind of crossed a threshold about ten years ago when they came up with the World Development Report, which was about conflict mm -hmm. and a big red cover on it, and it said that maybe one and a half or two billion people live in conflict affected spaces. And that number is actually only increasing. It's also true that in terms of development assistance, one of the things they point out is that 
as as the stable countries in the world graduate out of the need for development assistance, the countries that are left, which are you know Af often in kind of sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, in Central Asia, the countries that are left in, have stagnated in their development, and those are all fragile countries. Those are countries that are either in conflict or in danger of falling into conflict because their governance is so bad. And so from the point of view of a development professional, most of their portfolio is now in places where they don't know how to work mm. without understanding something about how conflict works. And it, it's, a, it's a serious challenge for them. And that's ongoing. And you know, COVID and Ukraine and climate change haven't changed that. They haven't made those things better. They've mm. just diverted interest away Yes, yes. From this, what they call the fragility challenge. Hey, I remember reading a report. Hang on, a report um, on poverty, and they were talking about these three Cs: so uh, uh, COVID, climate change, and conflict. Right, the three three sources of you know, of uh, cause of, of, of poverty, and um, and conflict is uh, is an uh, is an obvious one. Right, it's uh, I mean if the if the military and they're all at war, civilians are left behind, women, children, they have to, have to become refugees. They, they don't have any means of, you know, making, making of living, uh, there's a lot of malnutrition, you know, all these kind of things. It's ter terrible, right? Um, I, I, yeah, but the, 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 um, the irony is that the indirect effects of COVID climate change and Ukraine conflict yeah. um, may do more damage to human welfare than the direct effects. Wow. So the effects on the developing world of us losing, of the World Bank diverting its attention to the Ukraine. Yes, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's good. yeah. Right, and the food, the effect on food prices, um, those are, I, in the in my business, those are, the, the, those are first order concerns. It, it's, it, there was a deal that could have been made between the ruling coalition and uh, the folks in Tigray, who had who had run the country up till recently, up till like twenty, I can't remember, sixteen or seventeen. Yes, and um, they just they they failed to come to an agreement, and they just and so they started fighting over it. I mean, Ethiopia is a hard place to govern, but there were so many ways that that conflict could have been oh. could have could have been peacefully resolved, and and it. And were you was. doing some research in Addis Abeba when were you were uh, visiting, or, this, uh, or just visiting just to? Uh, um, just I imagine. was I, I was doing some mostly. I was visiting because I wanted a quiet place to write up some of some some other work, and oh, okay. my, it was somewhere that where my where we had friends and my family wanted to be. In. Oh, okay, okay. My my wife did some work in in HIV treatment. Oh, okay. And so Addis Ababa was a very good place for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, but I learned a lot about the, the UN peacekeeping mission. Is the is the Africom the the African Union's headquarters is in Addis Ababa. So the you so the African peacekeepers have their headquarters there. Mm -hmm. And I had some friends who were working in the back office mm -hmm. of that. And so it was actually a very useful place for me. To try out some of these ideas on practitioners, on peacekeepers. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, if you were to meet a philanthropist, you know, who uh, uh, who would like to uh, to give you money to do research, what would be the the, the best you know, return on investment, you know, on, on these kind of things? Where? Uh, oh, so so it, it, a philanthropist who really wants to do good would 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 invest not in projects, but in platforms. At false, okay. Yeah, so our, our problem is always, it's, it's relatively easy for us to say, here we have an intervention or we have a data set so we wanna follow this, we wanna study the following question and, and, and off we go. That, we find funding for those things. What's difficult to find funding for is the platforms because well, in order to, 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 to keep the, 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 the business running, Mm -hmm. You need to run annual conferences. You have to have regular meetings with the practitioners. You have to be, you need staffing to keep the, 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 the researchers safe in the field. Yeah. And you need a fair amount of data science capability. Mm -hmm. um, like you need some programmers in house or you need someone to teach this year's postdocs 
how to do the things that last year's postdocs need to do. You need kind of an, an ongoing infrastructure for research. Mm -hmm. And the campuses that I started out with, um, here at UCSD, Princeton, Chicago, Stanford to some extent, have some of that there. Okay. But what we need is kind of a, a single centralized place where all the expertise lives and we don't we don't drop balls for we don't have to make the same mistake twice. Oh. And, and the Kennedy School doesn't participate to, to that platform. No, no. No, no it, it's a very, I mean, it takes a unique combination of skills. Okay. I mean, so I can explain all this to you because you're an economist, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And you've got a data science background. But on top of that, to have intuition about these places, you need to you need to have been there. You need to, hmm. and so we tend to build research teams which have a practitioner in them or or have a veteran in them. So the, the three people I think I mentioned this, the three people that started it up, me, Joe, Felter, and Jake Shapiro, we're all veterans. Mm -hmm. And so we'd all been in places like this yes, at yes. some point. Um, and so the Kennedy School at the moment yeah. doesn't have somebody with the right combination of skills and experience. They're more like senior like politicians, so like you know, policy makers or people who are in Washington, DC, or they're, but they, they're not people on the ground, right? Like, you know, like, so, yeah, but those those people on the ground also have to have a PhD in yes. economics, political science, or data science. And that's rare. Those people, you know, are, I, and all of those people are so talented that they could be making, you know, twice as much as me working for Amazon. And so, so we. I, one you know, of my friends is, uh, well, my, my classmate at Harvard is, is Steve Tadelis. I don't know if you know Steve. Steve. right. So yeah. he, he was at the IDF too, I think, before his PhD. He, he, I remember he was a, I know he was a helicopter pilot. Or I, I'm not sure what he did, but he, uh, I remember yeah, so, he came so, to do his PhD. He was relatively older because, you know, because of his uh, years in the IDF, I think. No, no, no. Steve does wonderful work in IO. But yes, yes. Steve is a great example of somebody who, in the, at, at the height of an academic career, was hired by big tech yes. to go work in their research department. I think Steve is at yeah, yeah, yeah. Microsoft Research or Google Research, one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but you know, to find somebody who's got Steve-like talents mm. and to, to bolt them down for a couple of years yeah. to work on this stuff is, uh, is, a, it, is a bit of a challenge. And so it's... it's um, Programmatic funding, not project funding, is the thing. Okay, so plan, plan platform is important. Yeah. Uh, Prafula, do you have any questions? Or sorry, do I do I say Eli or Eli? I Eli. Eli, Eli. Okay, okay. Prafula, I don't know if you have. No, any no, no, I don't have any questions. Uh, okay. I don't have because all these distractions. I don't don't think I, I will have to watch the recording again. Oh, okay. No, I, um, so the, this when, thing, you, when you, all this happened, I was actually googling. To find out how to stop this stuff, you know. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, I think it's because uh, it's the person sharing the screen. I think the con has the control to to do the uh, uh, enabling the scribbling. Uh, I, I cannot I, I cannot do it because I've not, I didn't share the, the screen. Maybe next time I, I'll do I'll do the sh I share the screen and uh, and move the slides for the speaker. Maybe uh, I, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but also, you know, just say that. Uh, uh, if somebody does the scribbling, their name should show up, so that if we we can at least track down who did that. Yes, yeah, yeah. that is possible to do in Zoom. Apparently, I, this is the first time I'm enc encountering some strange thing like this. Yeah, okay. yeah, it, it's my first time as well. I've been teaching over Zoom for a long time. It might be that our 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 academic Zoom. I think it's the same as the as the professional business Zoom that you're using. But may, maybe it's got better controls on it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Uh, I have just one, one last last questions for the. So do you so to, today? Do you work with the DOD or do they uh, do they give you projects or do they ask you to work on Iran or North Korea or these kind of things or? I don't know. So, so we have an interesting That's relationship. Secret. I don't know. <laughs> we we have an interesting relationship with DOD and I, I in particular have an interesting relationship. The when they initially. When they initially um, reached out to us, um, what they wanted was to come have us, you know, work in the building for them. And we told them, no, 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 we we work independently. If you want the benefits of our research and of that of our colleagues and the peer review and all those things, 
write an NS, create an NSF-like program um, that, and we'll, we'll, we'll submit grant proposals and you'll decide to fund them or not. Um, but if you fund them, we're still gonna be independent. <laughs> we're not gonna, and because you've already got RAND and a whole bunch of other institutions that work on contract for you on these things. And they're obviously not solving your problem. So you want something that's independent. It's, it's for your own good. Mm. So a, a number of us, I wasn't the only one that made this argument, a number of us did. And they came around and they created a grant program, which is not huge, but it was big by social science standards. And, and we won a grant, which paid out something like nine or $10 million mm. over the first five years. And that allowed us to generate really to fund a platform mm. kind of independently. How um, about the DAPA? Is DAPA interested in, in, in the, the, the kind of work so, or not really? Are they more fundamental or they just care about AI or this kind of thing? Yeah, so DARPA will fund projects, but they won't fund, they won't give us programmatic funding. Oh, okay. And that's, um, I think that that's my struggle right now. And so um, often people will go and do, and lots of people who I know and respect, We'll, we'll go and work on a particular project for DARPA. We also have people who, who are kind of affiliated with these projects who will go and work for DOD yeah. for a year. In fact, one of my Jake Shapiro is, is at the Directorate of National Intelligence now mm -hmm. for two years mm -hmm. working on countering disinformation mm -hmm. and doing fantastic work as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. So there's all of that going on. Now for me personally, it's even more complicated because I hold a foreign passport. Okay. Yeah. And so, and I like using my foreign passport sometimes yeah. because it allows me to go to Israel. And yeah. so, so they say to me, you can't even get a security clearance permit oh. because of your, unless you surrender your foreign passport. Yes. And I tell them that no, it's okay. Oh. <laughs> I'll live fine without your security clearance. Even so, though Israel is an ally of the U.S., right? It's like, uh, it's, uh, yeah, even, it, it, even though, but, um, but it's fine. I'm, I'm, there's more than enough. Yes. Um, unclassified data. And I think that's the way it should be. I think the pressure should be on the client to declassify so that we can do the things that we usually do so we can have peer review and have replication yeah. properly. And I think that's the proper role of an academic. Yeah. Yeah. It, some of our students, some of my students will go and work for DOD or for, or for RAND or places like that. And that's fine too. Um, but I, 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 I think it's important that we have you know, some measure of independence. Yeah. Unfortunately, independence is expensive and we have to go past the hat with donors to make sure that we keep it. Uh, okay. I mean, also, I think the uh, last point is that I think for the for your field of research, I don't know if you have students working, uh, some of your students working with satellite imaging. It seems that there's a lot of data there and interesting stuff you could be done, right? In terms of uh, people monitor, you know, destruction or I think some, some, uh, some people did some research on, you know, uh, they, they were looking at a repo in Syria, you know, look at the, the damages, so you can like, time the damages, and there's a lot of stuff that you could, uh, could be done. You know? and, uh, there, there, there is. So I, I've reviewed a couple of papers, yeah. which are between us already, on, um, yeah, satellite imaging, which, which measures damage. Yeah. Um, there's also what we tried to do in Afghanistan, but, um, which was ambitious but failed, was... So, I mean, the, the core problem is that it's too dangerous to put researchers on the ground yes, or we have to do yeah. survey work on the ground. So what do you do? And if we had the budget, we would fly drones yeah. over and we would get very, very good imaging. Yeah. So, um, so there kind of remote sensing is one thing that we can do. And we've tried that. We've actually tried flying satellites over roads to see if road construction projects that the World Bank is paying for are actually being carried out. Yeah. yeah. Um, that it, the, when we were when we were trying this like eight years ago, the yeah. technology wasn't quite there yet. Oh, okay. Um, and it just had to do. It works in Africa, where the color of the of the construction material is very different from the color of the side of the road. Yeah. But in Afghanistan, where everything looks like the rocks below behind me, yeah. it just you you can't get enough differential in the imaging. It would, be, it would be very useful in Ukraine, right? Because in Ukraine, I think they are asking over like 300 billion dollars from the EU, right, for construction. Right. So 300, like 300 to 400 billion dollars 
and you want to make sure that this money is well spent, right? That is, uh, I mean, there's, you know, historically, Ukraine there's a lot of corruption there, so you want to make sure that the roads are built uh, and everything is, uh, so you know, right. you come up with some monitoring program for the EU, make sure that the money is well spent. They would be, uh, I mean, I would be ready. I mean, I don't know how they think, but even if oh. you spend $1 billion on this just for monitoring and make sure that it's well spent, it'd be a huge cost saving, right? Because uh, Oh, if absolutely. They, so, if, they spend, so, if they lose 10, 15 percent of 300 billion, it's huge because the amount of losses it would be enormous. It, it, right, and it was also the other problem is it undermines the, the willingness of the donors. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All democracies yeah. to 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 carry through. So I showed you the, those data from the election transparency intervention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which really reduced corruption by about 20 percentage points oh. in kind of the way that we could measure it, yeah. and it was very cheap. Yeah. That that paper spun off maybe two dozen other projects in Pakistan oh, and in India okay. of using cell phone based data to monitor whether teachers were showing up for work yes. and whether nurses and doctors were showing up for work, mm -hmm. whether pharmacists actually delivered drug that So there's a whole there, there's a whole uh, there's, uh, there's a whole vein of research which came out of this problem that yes. we can't monitor well. Yes. In which into which overlays with another problem, which complements another problem, which is that the the quality of local governance is horrible. Otherwise, people wouldn't be rebelling in the first place. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, and what they said was, any kid with a phone can take a picture of the quality of the service provided in, yeah. say, a clinic, because you can go in, you can take a picture of the medicine cabinet. That's true. That's true. Right? Or you can see with your eyes whether the doctor's actually there when you show up. Yeah. And then you transmit that information back and you've got another uh, leg of monitoring. So those projects have been extremely successful yeah. on actually on pollution monitoring as well. Yeah, that's so, true. At, uh, that, at UPenn, they have a big, like, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's the School of Public Health, I don't know how, how they're called there, but they, they do is the one issue is exactly that that you know they found this like you know a community healthcare center and so on, but the nurses they don't show up or you know they so how is like uh, so they uh, so they have to, to know because sometimes maybe the pay is very low or they have no I mean they have a lot of issue, but just to know that people show up or do they do around do they visit the villages are they are supposed to do or do they do the vaccination on time and so on? These the, the monitoring on the ground is so important. Yeah, yeah, so I think in the Ukraine, for instance, where you mentioned it, and because there's reconstruction to be done, which is not at the front lines, yeah. in, in the relatively safe parts of the Ukraine, but Ukraine does have a history of corruption. Yeah, yes. Those type of interventions are exactly what the World Bank or the European Reconstruction Bank should be insisting on, or NATO should yes. be insisting on, in order to make sure that the whole project is sustainable. Yeah. Even today, yeah. I mean, the, you know, they have the COP27 coming and you know, the, the European countries are asking for this $100 billion of contribution from which countries, right? But uh, which countries could say, okay, we want to make sure that the $100, $100 billion that we give you is well spent to, you know, climate change project and so on. It doesn't go into the pocket of the ruling party and this kind of thing. So these are... Uh, right, know, right. So, so my argument is, um, if we can, if we've gone to the most corrupt and fragile places in the world, and we've made projects work, then they're going to work anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so you, you know, we treat in, in many ways Afghanistan as a tragedy, but it, but it would be even more tragic if we didn't exploit the learning opportunity that we have there. Yeah. I mean, I. I yes. I thank you very much. We, we passed the time, time but uh, thank you very much for the time. It was very, very, very interesting. And sorry for the for the interruption, but. Uh, uh, keep uh, keep uh, reading your work and should keep in touch. And, uh, okay, I, I'm I'm I'd, I'd love to get feedback from yes. from anyone who's in the audience and yeah. did get a chance or yeah we'll uh, we'll post we'll post the video so you might get feedback too. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah. And if if you find the donor that wants to support my conferences, there it's wait I I have a whole menu starting at four figures and moving up to six. Okay, uh, good things we can do with people's money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Take care, Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mike.